There's this great quote by Pope Benedict. I'm, I'm going to have to paraphrase it because I don't have it perfectly right. But it's something like the only like truly effective apologetics are um, the art that the church has produced in its womb and the stories of the saints. Mm. Welcome back. I'm Darnell Miller, and today I'm sitting here with Haley Stewart, who's the editor of Word on Fire Spark. Haley, thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be back at UST. Absolutely. And uh, Word on Fire Spark, you publish children's literature. So tell me a little bit about the importance of children's literature, because um, I know when we think of little kids and reading, we think of like, yeah, they need to learn how to read. That's something that it's, it's going to be a life skill for later. But there's an importance to storytelling for children, correct? Yeah. So I think what you're referring to is kind of we often focus on like passing on information mm -hmm. like you read so that you can then take this information and put it in your brain like yeah. it's a database or something. Um, but with storytelling, I think that the real vision between, behind Word on Fire Spark, which is the imprint that I work for, is to form the imagination mm. of the child. And so stories are how human beings learn, right? That's how we understand the world. That's how we understand ourselves. That's why Jesus tells the disciples parables. You know, mm -hmm. this is the best way to communicate this truth through a story because that's how human beings are wired. And so if we're wanting to form the imagination of the child to understand the gospel, to understand themselves as part of this great story of God's love, mm -hmm. then we have to offer them really good stories that ring with truth. And I don't mean like it's a true story, it's historically accurate, but that it's a story that is true and good and beautiful, mm -hmm. whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So you say true and good and beautiful. And I, I think of um, children's stories from like, you know, several hundred years ago. I'm thinking of uh, like Oscar Wilde. I'm thinking of the Grimm brothers and Hans Christian Andersen. And those tended to be kind of gruesome. And I, it feels like they were told to scare little kids away from doing bad things into being good kids. Um, and I feel like stories have shifted a little bit where they tend to be more wholesome. They tend to have uh, be more holis holistic in their approach of how we educate a child. Um, do you see that to be the case or do you have a different perspective on that? Yeah, a little bit different perspective. I mean, I think a lot of those classics, you, you can look at them that way mm -hmm. of this is how to direct a child's behavior in one way or another. But I think a lot of them also are you, can be seen as kind of a reflection of the gospel. I'm thinking of like, say, Cinderella, mm -hmm. where you have this situation where things are amiss. Like there's this injustice. There's this good person, mm -hmm. Cinderella, and yet she's being tyrannized. She's being isolated. And so like the world is off balance. Things are not right. And then there's this shift and in Cinderella, it's the fairy godmother comes in and that's when everything starts to change. Mm -hmm. But that's still not the end of the story. You know, there's a point where you think the prince is never going to find Cinderella. She's locked away by her evil stepmother. Um, and then there's this flip, right, where mm -hmm. now the prince finds her, the, the person that is as good and beautiful as a princess is now a real princess. The, the stepmother who's always been this villain is exposed for her crimes. And so there's like this, um, this turning point that sets everything right. Mm -hmm. And so while you could see it as a, and here's why you should be nice children because Cinderella was nice and then look at what happened to her. You, you could look at it that way. But I think that it's more forming the imagination of the child in this gospel mindset, right? That like things are broken, mm -hmm. but this isn't the end of the story. Like the end of the story is when everything gets set right. Ah, uh, okay. All justice restored. Right. And okay. so... It, and I think as as children get older, of course, you have to get a little bit grittier mm -hmm. where you have to sh you have to be realistic that it's not going to always turn out the way we want it to. You know, that's not what this kind of hope means. Like mm -hmm. it's not this positive thinking or, or wishful thinking that things are going to turn out this way right now. Um, but 
it's essential that we offer children this sense that there's not going to be a final defeat. Like the final chapter of the story is God setting everything right. And whether that happens in this life or the next life, like that's the end of the story. And if we don't really have that kind of hope to anchor ourselves in, then we all really struggle to navigate a world where things go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so at Spark, you guys are working on stories that kind of like that have that aim. And you brought a book with yeah, you. Yeah. You so want to tell us a little bit about I'm that? I'm so excited about this. This is our first um, release that I've gotten to work on from start to finish. So it's by Alexi Sargent, illustrated by Anita Bargigiani. And it's called Saintly Creatures, 14 Tales of Animals and Their Holy Companions. So it's it's telling stories of different saints who have some connection to animals. So here we've got the boar in St. Bridget. Let me find, um, I really like the illustration for St. Martin de Porres. I think he's next. Um, St. Martin de Porres and the mice. And so there's all these stories about these saints and um, they're beautifully written. And, and the goal is to form the child's imagination so they can imagine a story in which they are they are the saint, mm -hmm. right? Um, to see like this is a possibility and to form your imagination to, to be able to see that. Like what would that be like? What kind mm -hmm. of saint would I be? What is God calling me to be like? And uh, we j have just started sending these out to reviewers and a friend of mine let her daughter read it and she she sent me a message that said, my daughter said, I want to be a saint after reading this book. And I was like, that's the goal. Like, that's what we're here for. Um, so there, I think there's so many different ways we can form a child's imagination, so many different kinds of stories that children need. Um, but I think these are really key. And it, it reminds me of, there's this great quote by Pope Benedict. I'm, I'm going to have to paraphrase it because I don't have it perfectly right. But it's something like the only, like, truly effective apologetics are um, the art that the church has produced in its womb and the stories of the saints. Mm. And I think about that a lot because I, I think that's really, at least true for me in times of doubt, mm -hmm. like what do I go to? I like, I go to the beautiful art of the church that mm -hmm. like at my core, I go like, yes, there's something to this. Or I go to the stories of the saints to like help me form my own imagination mm -hmm. to like re-enter that reality. I imagine in in uh, this role that you kind of, you think about this a lot, right? This idea yeah. <laughs> of like art and this idea of like vocation of, of our call to be saints. And so um, how do you think those are tied in? Like I know you, we, when we talk, uh, when we were kind of discussing what this conversation would be about, you talked about art and vocation. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. As, so as, a wife and mom. So I've got four kids, ages four through 14. Um, and then I'm a writer and I work in children's publishing. And so that's always at the forefront of my mind. You know, mm -hmm. how do I live out the vocation God's given me? How do I also use the creativity and talents that he's given mm -hmm. me to send out into the world? And there's so many messages that parents receive about like, what are we allowed to do, you know, to be a good parent or um, to be a good writer? You know, there's all mm -hmm. of these conflicting messages. And so something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is what does it mean to create art? And I've just so many different writers and, and artists I've been reading lately have touched on this idea that art is what happens within limitations. Mm. G.K. Chesterton has some great quote about art is what's inside the frame, you know, like, so there's these limitations. And I think Orson Welles, it was, who said something like, um, the absence of art is having no limitations. You know, mm -hmm. you have to have some sort of, of structure, form or framework for there to be art. That's why if you write a sonnet, it has to have a certain structure or, or it's not a sonnet. You mm -hmm. could write a different kind of poem, but it wouldn't be a sonnet. So we can look at those structures as limiting mm -hmm. or like burdensome, or we can see them as a place in which art flourishes. And so I was thinking about that regarding vocation, that as a mom, I don't have unlimited time to create. Mm 
You know, mm-hmm. there's there's all these limits that go with my vocation. Yeah. Right? I'm limited to love one man. I'm limited to pour my energy into raising these four children. Like there's these limits and you can look at them as like interfering with my freedom. Cause mm-hmm. like I've got all these writing projects I want to do, but alas, I'm limited. Like we could have that mindset and it's easy to fall into that because we don't have unlimited energy. We're mm-hmm. tired, you know, just all of these, you've got these different things to balance. But I was trying to think of what if we looked at our vocations as the place where God is creating art mm-hmm. through our lives. So like he's given us these limitations and we can view them as um, like stepping into our freedom, or we can view them as what actually allows us to create the artwork that God wants us to create with our lives. Mm -hmm. And so like the vocation of marriage, yes, you're limited to this one person, but you're free to totally love this person. You don't have to worry about anybody else anymore. Like there's this freedom in it. And so um, that's, it's just something I think about often, like how do we start to view these limitations as a gift Mm -hmm. that then allows us to pour out our lives into, you know, the specific thing that God wants us to do both in our families and whatever we're creating. So that brings to mind a lot of different things. So I'm going to start with uh, with two things first. Um, the, The going back to that idea of limitation, I'm reminded of of two things. The first is uh, Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. And so like you talked about the sonnet, like, uh, you know, a sonnet has a certain form. And I think of that in terms of, cause I mean, I, I write a lot and uh, it's all translated into either podcast or video, but what I am, the kind of project I'm working on determines like the framework in which I think. So if I'm gonna do a video, I need to think very visually. And then I need to think of like, okay, I need to show this when I'm talking about this, or I need to show that, or I need to think about these types of things of light and all that um, it's as part of the story. But when I'm thinking of podcasts, I, I think very differently because none of that matters. It's how do I create an opportunity for somebody to create a beautiful image in their head? And like, where, like, where does my voice come into that? And where does it need to step back in that? And so I, I think of those, those are like limitations that are brought about and it, it would not make no sense for me to create a podcast and think of all the visuals because I, that's not going to be that it's not necessary information for that project. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing I think of is uh, this idea of, of limitation. And I know that in our culture, like limitation seems like we're depriving ourselves. It's a bad thing. But when certain people talk about it, it's like, yeah, that's a great idea. They're a genius. And I think of Jack White. Um, because Jack White, and I think I forget, uh, it might get a lot, I think it's a documentary talks about this, talks about um, the liberation of limitation and how he, he artificially creates the idea of limitation and what he's doing. He's like, there's only two people in our band. We can only do so much live. Um, and so he's like, and we just have to operate that way. And that is a limitation we've set on ourselves to do what we can do. And I don't think anybody's going to argue that they're not a successful group, that they're right. not great. <laughs> And so I think of like in that context, everybody's like, man, he's a genius. Yeah. But that's that's the way we should be thinking of Art a vocation. thriving within those limitations. Yeah. This is okay, this is such a nerdy example, but the original Star Wars. Mm-hmm. So they had really big budget limitations. So they were having to create all these props out of like found objects. Mm-hmm. So like the lightsaber, I think, is some sort of like camera like piece of a camera that they use a certain way. And so they're like reusing all of these items because they didn't have unlimited money to just create whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But what that does is it creates this like subconsciously as the viewer, you kind of have this familiarity with these objects. Like you're looking at it and you're like, what? Okay, I I don't know what a lightsaber is, but like something about this object makes sense to my brain. Like Mm -hmm. it's this really cool experience. So like the art was thriving within those limitations Mm -hmm. in a way I think you could argue it doesn't later on. When they have unlimited budget, when they can do anything, it's like falling apart, you know? But (laughs) then when it's like, we don't have very much money, we've got to use this old camera thing and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And then the, the, the other thing I was thinking of is when we we're talking about vocation and I feel like, cause I, I mean, I, I think of when I was in college and I thought of my vocation, I was like, yeah, what job am I going to get? And now that I'm married, 
I'm, I think about it very differently. I'm just like, yeah, my job is cool. And that is like a, like a minor vocation. Like, yes, this is work that I'm called to and I, it's important and, and all of that. But my primary vocation is being married. It is serving my wife. Um, and so I just kind of talk about, want to talk about clarifying those calls of vocation, because I think when people think of that, they're like, oh yeah, what's my big job going to be? And mm -hmm. like, you know, they're like religious falls into that because that is the thing they end up doing, but uh, that's also not a job. Right. So uh, can yeah. we break that down yeah. just a little bit? So vocation, like we use it as a Catholic word. Mm -hmm. We're saying like, what is the calling that God has given me and that's primarily relational, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a vocation either to marriage and um, openness to children, or it's a vocation to religious life, this mm -hmm. kind of special kind of relationship with God and the church. And um, so it, it's interesting to me as a convert, because I was raised Protestant, that it just wasn't a question I asked myself, like, what's my vocation going to be? Mm -hmm. um, and so I... I think that it's like a part of my life, like that discernment process of like, what am I called? Like, it was just like, well, I'll probably get married, you mm -hmm. know, if the right person shows up. Um, so I'm really like, I love talking about vocation, this idea of discerning God's call on our life and like, what is the particular way that God wants to use me in the world within these different frameworks that he gives us. Um, so that idea of vocation is going to be primary in our lives above anything else. Mm -hmm. So like my vocation to my marriage is above my vocation as a writer. Mm -hmm. right? um, but I think also God does call us to use the gifts that he gives us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's important. And I think that that's something that a lot of times there's some resistance to, especially moms <laughs> doing like, mm -hmm. well, you know, kids are the most important job. And so that's like, don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, our children are of primary importance, but that doesn't have to mean that we're not called to do other work as well in mm -hmm. the world. And so the difficult thing is discerning, which is something every couple has to do on their own, like discern, how do we make that work? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we balance those things out? Um, and how do we determine during different seasons of our lives what we can and can't do. You know, I could write more books if I totally ignored my children, but that wouldn't be good, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I have to work within these limitations. And yet I find that the, the limitations that my vocation brings actually help my work to thrive. Mm -hmm. Like they, they are feeding that work and they're informing that work in a way that I wouldn't be able to write what I write without that those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is such a beautiful like counterpoint to I think just our mainstream image of what an artist is or is supposed to be. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think so much of it if we have this attitude of we're a family and we're a team. Mm. And so like as a family, how do we help the different members of the family um, cultivate the gifts that God's given them. And so that doesn't mean one member of the family gets to pursue every creative pursuit at the expense of everyone else, but this sense of how can we support each other mm. as spouses and support our children in cultivating those talents. And then it just has a different feel, you know, when your family is like, hey, this thing is important to you, how can we make this work? Mm -hmm. Rather than we're gonna see these as competing, um, you're competing for these resources and yeah. they're opposed to each other. Instead, how, how are we working together? This has been a great conversation. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. And where can people go to find this book and to find out more about what you were doing with Spark? Sure, so this book is going to be available September 18th, um, this fall from Word on Fire. So you can just go to Word on Fire's online store and get the book there. Um, we're so excited to launch it. And you can just um, go to www.wordonfire.org slash spark to see everything that's going on with Word on Fire Spark and get on our free email list. We've got a lot of fantastic books in the works that we're just so excited about. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. This Absolutely. is great. And thank you guys for watching.